live, local. This is Fox 12 Now. Hello everyone, this is Fox 12 Now. I'm Greg Nibbler. That right there is a live shot of Mount St. Helens, as you probably know if you are here in the Northwest. And that's from our Shriners Cam in downtown Portland, so it is kind of amazing how close we can zoom in, but we're talking about Mount St. Helens today because well, there's a lot of things going on up there. We're going to find out exactly what that is here coming up during this segment. This is Fox 12 Now. We live stream here every weekday starting around 1 p.m. Pacific, covering a wide range of topics. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget, you can go to kptv.com and, of course, the Fox 12 Oregon app, two places to find all of these segments after we get to talk about them. But you've probably heard some news about Mount St. Helens lately. It seems there's been an uptick in seismic activity. There's some reports saying that it is recharging. Um, is there more magma coming in? People are worried, is it going to erupt? There's a lot of questions that are going on there. We're going to attempt to get those answered today, not by myself, but by our guest. Joining us right now, we have Seth Moran from uh, the USGS, a research seismologist. And Seth, thank you very much for joining us today to talk about this. This is, uh, I see it trending all over the place right now, people talking about what's happening up there at Mount St. Helens. And I guess to start off, can you tell us, you know, about this recent uptick in seismic activity? Is this out of the ordinary or is it something that honestly we should just expect to happen on a regular basis? Yeah, well, I guess, you know, the first thing is that we've been monitoring Mount St. Helens since 1980, and we, USGS, also University of Washington Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, it's one of the best monitored volcanoes in the world. And uh, that allows us to see things that um, really, really, really small earthquakes and uh, other sort of subtle changes that happen probably at volcanoes all the time when they're not erupting. Um, and so certainly, um, we have gained a lot of experience and perspective on the kinds of earthquakes that happen at Mount St. Helens and sort of the ebbs and flows of seismicity over time. It last erupted 2004 or 2008. Since then, uh, we've seen sort of progressively uh, increasing rates of seismicity. That pictograph right there shows that quite nicely. Um, and uh, and But it's not like, you know, it sort of comes and goes. There are spurts that last for weeks or months, and then there's other periods of time where it's a more uh, uh, ebbing. Um, and this last, starting about February uh, up until now, uh, we've seen a slow, steady kind of uptick in small earthquakes. And important to emphasize, the largest is a magnitude two. Most of these are below magnitude one. Some of them are even mind blown, negative magnitude earthquakes, um, which just means teeny, teeny, tiny earthquakes. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah, negative. I'd never heard that one before. So, so you know, the, the fact that these are happening then, and as you mentioned, this is so well monitored. Is that part of the reason that we're able to notice such minute detail that goes on there uh, on Mount St. Helens compared to maybe other volcanoes around the world? Um, it certainly helps. It certainly helps. And our goal at places like Mount St. Helens and other volcanoes in the Cascades that uh, would be big problems uh, where they erupt again, like Mount Rainier, Mount Hood. Um, our goal is to be able to detect, you know, as small an earthquake as possible. Um, so, you know, magnitude zeros. That's where we're sort of aiming at, and and St. Helens has that uh, has that perspective. Going going back before Mount St. Helens erupted, to, uh, from 1986 to 2004 was a period of time when nothing was coming out of the ground, um, but we saw similar kinds of months of uptick and then uh, months of sort of ebbing of seismicity rates. Um, back then, the earthquakes, on average, we were seeing slightly bigger earthquakes. There were more of them. Um, and uh, the interpretation, one interpretation of those is that it was the magmatic system kind of recovering from the previous eruption and kind of getting ready for the next one. Uh, looking at that historical data and talking about that leading up to the 2004 eruption that we had after the original one, does it seem like we're in that period again with enough years where it's recharged and we could anticipate an eruption happening? Um, you know, that that is uh, certainly we, we are, you know, Mount St. Helens is an active system and these earthquakes are a manifestation of that. And it's, you know, a, a, a pretty logical interpretation uh, that what we're seeing now compared to what was happening in 86 through 2004, is a similar kind of process. Um, and we also know that Mount St. Helens is how it has been for the last 4,000 years, the most frequently erupting volcano in the Cascades. And going back, geologists have sort of unearthed evidence that about an average, there's an eruption once a century. Um, um, and 
uh, when you do get eruptions happening, sometimes they happen in clusters. In 1980 to 86, there were a series of 20 lava dome building eruptions. Then there was an 18-year gap, and then we had a three uh, and a quarter year continuous lava dome building eruption. Um, so one way of viewing this is that this is just kind of a continuation of the process that ultimately started back in 1980. And every so often, we probably should expect that Mount St. Helens will wake up again. And given that fact, you know, that, yeah, as you mentioned, that it, that it could be erupting, um, just to understand the the geological side of it just a little bit more. So this is magma that's coming back in to somewhere underneath there. That's what's causing those seismic earthquakes? So we obviously can't look down there and see right. exactly what's happening. That's certainly one inference. Um, but there's other possibilities, too, including that what didn't erupt in 1980 is still in sort of the mid to upper crust and is kind of cooling over time and generating gases and fluids that are coming up into areas where they're helping rock break. Um, what the, really the earthquakes are, are are what we can detect and they're sort of a symptom. And then the job of the scientists and the observatory is to diagnose the symptoms and come up with a sort of likely interpretation. And certainly repressurization, recharge is a, is, a, is a pretty likely interpretation, a pretty likely explanation. And given that uh, repressurization, uh, repressurization, I guess, and recharge that's going on there, how likely do you think it is, based on the data that we have right now, that we could see some sort of an eruption over the next couple of years? Well, you know, it's it, again hard to know. Um, I think the geologic record is our best guide that, uh, you know, once a century, and here it is 18 years. So, you know, one could do some fairly simple math to come up with some sort of likelihood. But in reality, I think what we, uh, what we need to pay attention to is the lesson St. Helens has, has taught us from the, la the last two times it's erupted on our watch, uh, which was 1980. There was about a week between the first earthquake and the first explosion at the summit. And in 2004, there were eight days between the first significant earthquakes that were more significant than what we're seeing right now in terms of numbers. That was a lot more. Um, and, uh, and then eight days later, the first explosion. Uh, so um, the lessons being Mount St. Helens, when it does wake up, can go pretty fast from a state of significant unrest to an explosion. And the second lesson is it's pretty obvious when Mount St. Helens has woken up. And what we're seeing right now is not that. And that's that's great to know, that information right there. So when it does next, you know, wake up, and again, this, I realize this is speculation, but if we do look at something, you know, would it be more likely it would be more like 2004, uh, that that style of an eruption should something to, to occur? Well, you know, I, I guess, you know, one, one thing to say just off the top is that we're having conversations like that right now in the observatory about what kinds of things might we expect to see uh, and what kinds of eruptions might we expect to, to see. And the geologic record is, again, really a, a, a primary uh, uh, teacher of um, for us in terms of those kinds of questions. And um, I think, you know, right now, the the simplest um, uh, expectation is that we would get a repeat of 2004, 2008. And so looking at something like that as, as far as uh, as far as what to come through. Um, so something else I just want to talk about, because you mentioned going back to the beginning of just how well monitored Mount St. Helens is, and I think that's really interesting, has the, as the rapid advancement of technology and the different ways that you're able to track these kinds of things really helped out? Have you seen an exponential growth in that in the recent years? Yes. Um, I mean, the short answer is yes. Uh, instruments today are much uh, less power hungry. Um, they can put out a lot more data. And so we have more instruments now than we did even back in 2004. Um, and the variety of instruments is greater. 2004, it was basically only a seismic network that was out there. Now what's out there is uh, a bigger seismic network, a denser seismic network, and also an equivalently dense network of GPS stations that are out there anchored to the ground, but their job is to tell us if they've moved even just like a quarter inch. And uh, then we've also had one of the first um, continuous gas monitoring stations uh, deployed in the United States, kind of anywhere um, that's in the crater. And uh, then also a sort of fairly new technology um, are um, what, what's called infrasound, which is um, sound waves that are in the air that our ears can't hear. They're too low frequency. 
uh, so like 20 hertz and below. Um, so we have instruments out there on the surface that were able to detect infrasound. And that's important because um, any kind of uh, surface event, like an explosion, will produce infrasound. And um, when you look at the seismic data, it can be a little bit difficult to figure out what you're seeing. Infrasound can really help you nail down something like that. Interesting. Yeah, so that's something, even if it was a small event, you would be able to detect it through that, through that yeah. kind of technology. Wow, that's incredible. And I would imagine that it's constantly evolving too as far as what you're able to do. Do you, do you guys incorporate, and this may be uh, out in the weeds, but do you incorporate any kind of artificial intelligence or machine learning when it comes to uh, interpreting this data? Um, there are some scientists who are working on machine learning and sort of looking uh, for ways in which that can then can help us. I mean, certainly I, I think you know the, the point that you're alluding to is that there's a lot of data. And so yeah. at some point it gets past the point where human eyes can absorb it all. And uh, we certainly still do our best. And we have a, a number, a team of seismologists here and a team of other scientists who are looking at the data all the time. Um, but, you know, uh, it's also certainly a situation where, um, where computers can help us. So we're definitely looking at that. Great. Well, uh, Seth, you know, I want to say thank you very much, you know, for joining us to, to walk through all this. And I think just to just to reiterate through everything that you just said here to answer the question that everybody has, is Mount St. Helens going to erupt? It will erupt again sometime, but what we're seeing right now is not le uh, telling us that right now is where it's going to be. Uh, is, is that's the direction it's moving? All right, perfect, Seth. Thank you very much for joining us today. Really, really appreciate it. You're welcome. And for everybody watching too, this is Fox 12 Now, so we are live here every weekday. And since we're live streaming, we'd have these longer form segments. We can go deeper uh, into the questions that people want to get answered. And so we appreciate you joining us. Check out all of the other topics and segments that we have at kptv.com or the Fox 12 Now tab and the Fox 12 Oregon tab. We are continuing throughout the rest of the afternoon, though. So at 2 o'clock, we've got the Fox 12 Weather Podcast. So you'll definitely want to tune in for that. It's the podcast, the audio podcast, but you get to see them and you get to go through their charts and everything that they're doing. That's at 2 p.m. Before that, though, at 1.30 p.m., completely switching gears, we're going to be talking to D. Snyder from Twisted Sister. So changing it up a little bit, that's going to be uh, coming up here at 1.30 p.m. So D. Snyder joining the show and uh, lots more going on throughout the afternoon. So thanks for joining us. Whatever platform you're on, this is where I'll be. If there's breaking news, this is a great place to go as well. Uh, we'll have that information for you here too. But we'll sign off right now. We'll regroup. I'll talk to you in just a few. I'm Greg Nibbler. This is Fox 12 Now.